Um, okay, I didn't get up this morning. Um, and I want to just have a little bit of a discussion uh, before uh, we get into the uh, section of scripture that we are looking at today. Um, I want you to think about some of your favorite things. Right? I'm not going to instruct you specifically in terms of how you've got to frame that, but I want, I want you to, you have, I don't know if it's a favorite food or a favorite memory or a favorite place or something when you think about a collection of your favorite things, what is in that team clothing? Right? Think about it for a second. I'll give you, I'll give you that.
And I did it this morning, so every morning that my daughter will let me, which is any morning I want. <laughs> In anticipation, you wake up, you drive over to Tim Horton, you get the no dip donut, which has sprinkles all over. And then you drive to your grandchildren's home. In anticipation of their reception of these donuts, right? And you walk in, and you see they don't say hi to you, but they're looking over their shoulders like, yeah, is this just a cup or is this a cup and a donut? <laughs> and you know, you have the hand behind the back, so then he's doing the test. And then you go like this, and this is what he does. <laughs> I can't see that. I know 
know you guys really want to see all my compassion at the end. Oh, sorry. But thank you. Um, they don't always accept it. They don't always, like, it's not like every time you share Jesus, somebody will, like, want to pray and accept them or something. But there's something fulfilling about just talking about your Savior. Way, way to make it spiritual. I know. We're talking about that. Why do I go to church? Try to ruin it. Anybody else?
you did. She, you swore you didn't ever want to do it again. Yeah. Now we're going to have a family fight. Praise the Lord. So, we've been talking through. This doesn't happen at the church, by the way, in case you want to find another one. We've been talking through the book of James. Uh, James uh, is an interesting book. He has a lot of practical uh, lessons that he uh, gives to us in his writings. It really wasn't intended as a. Uh, uh, one letter per se, so you have in various chapters he addresses different topics. So it's kind of hard to take one chapter, so I'm just going to take a chunk of this one. Um, and because of it, it seems somewhat disconnected, um, all of the topics of these uh, are useful, helpful. It's a great discussion to have. If you've never read the book of James, I encourage you to do it. And if you just show up on Sundays, you will have pretty much heard it. Um, He's addressing a situation, a specific situation in a, in a church. And I think it, it kind of exposes a tendency uh, in human nature a little bit. Let's be honest, we all have favorites. Whether it's a favorite food or a favorite memory, I'll just ask you this question and you can think about it internally. How many of you, I know as Christians we're supposed to love other people, how many of you would say you love everyone the same? If we're honest, if we're trying to put on our best Christian face, we're like, yes, we love them all. We love them all. Praise the Lord. But the reality is there's some people you love a little less. Okay? I mean, you again, I don't, but we don't want to admit it. We don't really want to talk about it. We don't need to put people's names on that. But some people... We don't love everyone on the same way field, right? We don't treat everyone the same. Are there, there's people that you treat differently than other people, right? How do you determine that? How do you determine the way in which you love and treat other people? Now, we're supposed to love others the way God has loved us. We're supposed to um, treat other people selflessly and uh, to give to others and Turn the other cheek and do all this to pray for our enemies and love those who hate us. But when that all gets put into this equation of being a human, we don't always perfect all of those things at the same time. Some people we treat with more deference than others. Uh, so I, I tend to like to hang around people who agree with me. It's, it's just easier. Right? I tend to like I tend to like to celebrate birthdays of people who celebrate mine. I, I tend to be more comfortable around people that have the same value systems that I do, and, and I, I try to encourage that as much as possible. And if they need help with something, I'll help them. I tend to like to help people who help me at some point, right? How hard is it when somebody asks you for help and you know last time you asked them, they said no. Have you ever been in that situation? Okay, okay. And how easy is it for you to say, well, man, isn't this fancy? You need help, huh? Well, I needed help last week. And you said no. Sorry. I'm getting my plank through them. Isn't that human nature? While I understand that, I wonder what God has to say. James is looking at a church and he's looking at how this kind of tendency between human nature and what God's called us to comes into conflict. And he's asking us to look a little deeper at ourselves and to see if there is a, a sinful flaw that needs to be addressed. And so I want to just look and start in James chapter 2. And it's easy to read this, many of you have read it several times, and to just kind of sit past it and not really apply it internally or to yourself, something God wants to respond to, and I want us to just look at it more intensely. He says, my brothers, 
as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here is a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? So what I need you to understand is there is the practical situation that he is potentially addressing here, which is in a gathering of believers, there were rich and poor all alike. Right? And there was this sense that there was kind of special treatment given to people that were wealthy. They had gold rings and whatnot. And people would kind of fall all over themselves trying to make them feel comfortable, trying to make them feel wealthy. Why? Because well, they have great status and influence and resources, and we need to make sure we do everything we can to make sure they're happy, because they can help us. And then when it came to certain poor people, they were treated in a way that was less than considerate. Instead of offering them good seats or going out of our way to make them comfortable, what was happening is that people were kind of like it, considering them sort of as in the way of other things that were more important. And so James is calling a time out, and he's saying, well, listen, it is important that you understand that you not treat people with favoritism in this way. So I hear that from James, and I'm thinking, well, I mean, I don't do that. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't make, go out of my way to make somebody who I think is poor feel uncomfortable or go out of my way to make somebody that I think has a lot of resources or is wealthy and make sure that they get special treatment. I, I don't think I do that. I try not to do that. I try to treat everyone with love and consideration. But the reality is if I'm more, when I think about it more, the truth is, the truth is I, I, I do sometimes change my behavior based on how I treat people and what I think they can do for me. And God might be measuring us not just on how we treat people that have something to offer us, but how we treat people that have absolutely nothing to offer us other than an opportunity for us to show grace, love, and mercy. You see, it's easy to treat people with kindness if you think you'll get kindness in return. It's easy to give forgiveness if you realize that, that the person will then treat you with forgiveness and grace in return. But how we treat people who have no pretense of anything to offer us, of anything to bid, that will benefit us by us showing kindness and grace and favoritism, you can't show favoritism. It, it's, that's what we're measured by. So listen to what he goes on to say. He says, verse 5, Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? Okay, so I want you to pay attention to how James is reshaping the conversation. He is talking about, you might have a perception of how a relationship that you are, uh, are interacting with somebody in can benefit you. But he's asking us to look at things from God's perspective. In God's economy, those who are rich may be poor, and those who are poor may be rich. Because it has nothing to do with dollars in bank accounts. Hello? In God's eyes, your wealth has nothing to do with how much stuff you have. Can, can, we, can we just let that sit with you? Because for some of you, that's going to be uncomfortable. For some of you, that's going to be a relief. God 
God views your wealth in a wholly different type of evaluation. It has nothing to do with your accounting, it has nothing to do with your checking, it has nothing to do with your assets and your things. It has everything to do with your heart. And so what James is pointing out here is you may be showing favor. The reason why favoritism in this way is wrong is because you might be showing favoritism to somebody you think is wealthy. In reality, they are poor. And you might be showing somebody disrespect who you think is poor. In reality, they, in God's eyes, they have great faith in something tremendous to offer you that you can't even see. And so that's what he's asking us to do. I want to go on. He says, verse 6. But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you to court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. If you do not show favoritism, if you, if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So this is disturbing. One of the problems with modern Christianity is that we tend to try to evaluate ourselves based on how other people are doing. We kind of look around and say, well, I'm not as messed up as they are. And there is this whole conversation that we can have about what, what sins we're okay with committing and what sins we're not. We know all sin is wrong and it's bad, but you know, not all sin is necessarily as, like, de detestable to us. Like, I might, I might, I might, you know, cut in front of somebody in line and, and you, know, you know, act like I didn't hear them or didn't know they were there, but, you know, I wouldn't murder somebody. Whoa, hey, slow down. So listen, listen to what he's saying. And this, this place is kind of a, a different perspective on how we do sin. What he's saying is if you have sinned, it's as if you have committed all of the sin. If you've committed one sin, if you've broken the law in one way, you've broken all of them. And I want you to listen to how he unpacks it here. He says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Okay? So just when people, he's responding to the internal argument about favoritism and how people can disregard it. It's not, it's not really that big of a deal, is it? I mean, come on, everybody does it. Everybody treats people, you know, with certain respect or disrespect. He's raising the bar here and saying, if you have sinned, it's the same as if you've sinned and broken all of the laws. If you sin in the way you treat people, it's the same as if you've committed adultery or murder. Are you listening to this? There's a whole lot of Christians who would never go that far, but at the same time are okay with treating people in the way God would not have us. And he said, if you, if, you break the, if you broke the law, you've broken all of it. So hopefully he has something good that we can finish on. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. What a great word and a great word of encouragement for us. And what he's saying is in our interactions with people, you will always have an opportunity to pile on someone or to show them mercy. We as believers, 
every single time, as often as we can, need to show mercy instead of judgment. It is not difficult to go around this room and we could start pointing out all the things in each one of our lives that we could be judged for. God says, show mercy. I, if you want me to show mercy to you, show mercy to others. So in God's economy, we're not supposed to look at superficial things. We're not supposed to judge people based on just what we see on the outside. Because you don't know how far somebody has come in their journey to becoming more like Christ. You don't know what they have gone through to get to where they are. Right? And are they perfect? Neither am I. But we can grow and learn. So God says, don't you, don't judge people on these external things and show mercy. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment between believers and between people. Mercy triumphs over judgment when you stand before God and you claim the blood of Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for my sins and your sins. We're asking God to show mercy. And He's going to look at us and say, Have you shown mercy to others? Guys, here's the rule. Whenever you have a chance to show mercy, do it. Whenever the chance that you have to give somebody some encouragement who maybe has nothing to offer you, do it. When you have a chance to give something to somebody that will lift them up, and whether they can return it to you or not, do it. Because that is the situation that we stand before God in. I have nothing to offer Him. You think God is waiting to receive my great riches? No. You think God is waiting to receive grace from me? No. I'm the one who needs God to show me mercy. I'm the one who needs God to provide for me. I'm the one who is needy in this situation before God. And those who are needy in need of a Savior should treat others with the same kind of respect and the same kind of grace and the same kind of mercy that we're asking God to give us. You don't know, like James. You're not the only one. But I encourage you to listen to his thoughts on how we can treat each other in a way that we honor to God and glorify him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know we all have favorites and favorite things, but when it comes to our relationship with people, God, I pray that you would break our hearts for those who have, may have nothing that we think to offer us. May you help us to show mercy to those who may not even deserve it or be asking for it. But God, I ask also that as we do this, as we embark on this journey of mercy, this, this uh, mission of freedom under the law of Jesus Christ, that you would inspire us and enable us to treat people in a way that would be honoring and glorifying to you and that would bring about our salvation through your mercy, God. Thank you so much for being here with us. Help us to listen to your word and apply it to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Before I let you go, there's a couple things I want you to do now. Um, one is I, I, I love I love you. I love your I love your favorite things. I love when you get a chance to talk and get to know each other a little bit more. Um, on the back table here. We have some Echo shirts from the youth group from last year. Um, they have last year's date on them and such. We have some that are left over. If you'd like one, grab one on your way out um, and wear it. Uh, just just go wear it. Um, if you get drunk a lot or if you're like uh, swearing at people or being a bad example, just wear a different shirt that day. Uh, but no, we're, wear it and just we'd like to promote our youth group and our, our church. So you're welcome to grab one of those on the way out. Um, if we don't have your size or you don't like the color, it's free! <laughs> um, so do that. We've got new, new Echo, Echo sweatshirts coming in for this year, so we're excited.
excited to get this going. Um, the next thing I'd like to remind you of is we are going to gather for a, a church meeting afterwards. We have some business to handle, so I invite you to uh, stay, whether you remember or not, and be part of that session. God bless you all. Thank you. God, this drives to go.